All right, guys, uh, welcome back to my channel. Uh, today we have a special guest with me, uh, Matt Hawkins, who is one of my favorite crime writers. Uh, he also does other stuff, uh, romance, which is not my normal <laughs> reading, but I am really enjoying uh, what we're going to talk about today. But I'll let him introduce himself, give you some of his work, and that way you can kind of get familiarized before we get into some questions about his series. Hi, my name is Matt Hawkins. I'm the president and CEO of Top Cow Productions. I've been working with Mark Silvestri there for a little over 22 years now. Um, I've been at Image Comics uh, since 1993. I was originally at Extreme Studios from uh, 93 through 96. Then I had a book at Image Central called Lady Pendragon I did in 97 and 98, and I've been at Top Cow ever since. So, Awesome. Um, and I mean... Uh, people who watch my channel, you know, I love a lot of image work, uh, which blade is uh, kind of what got me into image. But now, of course, Saga and uh, Deadly Class and so many other great series. Uh, but today I want to uh, talk about some stuff that you created. So you create a lot of different stories, a lot of different genres, which is kind of nice. A lot of writers I have, they kind of stuck to a same genre. Um, but I always like to ask writers, uh, you've created so much. What would be the first story that you've written, and you've written a lot, um, that you would kind of introduce someone to your work and say, this is kind of what I do, but then I have other stuff as well? You know, it, it would depend on what they like. You know, I always ask people, do you read comics at conventions? Because, you know, 90% of the people that walk through conventions, they don't. Um, but I ask if they read comics, and if they say yes, I said, what do you read? And they'll say science fiction, they'll sell this, they'll sell that. And I'll sort of tailor, you know, what I've done to that. Uh, usually it's think tank, postal, or swing depending on who it is. Uh, if it's a, a middle-aged woman who's looking at my Swing and Sunstone books on the table, I, I will, uh, I say, have you heard of these things? Do you like, you know, adult romance? Um, and then I'll go into my pitch. Um, but it's usually Think Tank. I think Think Tank is probably my most personal book. I mean, it's largely about uh, the life I could have had if I was a little smarter, you know, and had done what my father wanted me to do <laughs> with my life, you know, rather than being a illusory comic person like I am. Um, but uh I, I'm just kidding. I love comics. And I, I love my career and what I do. But uh, this is not what I was supposed to do. I have a physics degree that I don't use for much of anything. And my dad was an engineer for the military for, for many, many years. And uh, my sisters, uh, you know, also got massive amount of degrees and pedigrees. And so I'm the dumb one in the family. So it kind of is what it is. But Think Tank is, you know, it's about a scientist who developed weapons for the military. Uh, he wants to quit and he's too valuable. So they won't let him quit. It's it's that's really the uh, simple pitch of it. The science is reasonably accurate. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just a lot of fun. If you like the movie Real Genius and you like sort of smart, like ha Real Genius and House, those are the two uh, sort of stories. I say if you like these two stories, you probably will like Think Tank. Yeah, Think Tank is actually the first uh, book that my friend picked up from you, and he introduced me to you at a Comic-Con, this is years ago in Tampa, and uh, it just came out postal, the first graphic novel, or not even out yet, you had an advanced copy before the graphic novel was coming out, and you were selling right. them, and Think Tank, he was big into it already, and I picked that up, but then you were kind of describing what postal's like, and that was kind of for me, that was like when you said it was like uh, crime, but uh, they're criminals in this small town. I was just like already anything else you say, I'm already reading it because there's not <laughs> enough of that. Um, you yeah, know, I, I can I can read crime stories all day. So uh, they actually uh, before we get to more postal, which I absolutely love uh, swing is uh, the big book that you're uh, currently. I mean, it, it seems to be yeah. selling really well. I always see it on Amazon bestseller. But uh, yeah. what I really like about swing is that we're almost done. I like stories that completely finish and not go on 50 years. Um, so with swing, you're in going into the final arc. Um, and I have to ask before, uh, are, are we going to get more of them? Because I love Dan and Kathy. I don't want them to go. No, uh, Swing Volume 5 will be the final volume with those characters. In fact, okay. the uh, the last page of the Volume 5 has them in their 80s. Oh, a nice time skip. I like that. So um, it's, uh, you know, I, I mean, that might be a, a bit of a, a reveal, but uh, these things generally end happily ever after, you know, and they, they've gone through their travails, but uh you know, they're, they're sitting on their porch in their 80s and they're laughing about the shit they used to do when they were kids, you know, and, that, and when they're when you're 80, I think you think of yourself as a kid when you're 30, you know, yeah. I'm 52 two now. So a 30 year old does seem young to me now, <laughs> which is weird because when I was 15, 30 seemed old, yeah. you know, so now that I'm 52 and 30 seems young, it's uh, it's a whole different world. <laughs> <laughs> well, with swing, uh, uh, you know, I got into it because of um, Sunstone uh, and uh, when I saw that that was coming out and Sugar, uh, I was really excited. Um, one question before I want to get uh, to the second question of Swing is, 
are we getting any more sugar? Because I actually liked it. I know it's not as big as the others. The, the plan always was to do so. If you look at Swing Volume 1, the artist was Linda Sedgick. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at Sugar Volume 1, the artist was Yishin Lee. Uh, if you look at Swing Volume 2 through 5, the artist is Yishin Lee. And, and Linda is doing her other projects. She's not working with me on any of my projects anymore because she has so many of her own. I mean, I'm still publishing all her work. I'm her publisher and sometimes her editor and her, sometimes her collaborator. But she's doing Punderworld and Bloodstain, and, and she's got all of her own stuff. So um, Yishin and I were focusing on swing because I had a more definitive arc and plan on what I was doing. I keep going back and looking at sugar and swing outsold sugar. You know, sometimes yeah. that's, it's a business. That's it. It's called yeah. show business. It's the comic book business. You know, I know people hate to hear that, but uh, there's a reason why I'm doing more volumes of swing and, and, and less volumes of a lot of the stuff. It's just, yeah. uh, you know, my book swing sells 10 copies to every one uh, of think tank. You know, I mean, wow. it's a radical, uh, Damn, I don't know why my cat, can you see my cat over here? He's like scratching on the wall again outside. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what the hell he's doing over there. <laughs> I'm like, hello. But uh, so, yeah, definitely uh, sugar. You know, the, the one of those things that you worry about is like, it's been a number of years since I've done sugar. So yeah. do I do sugar volume two? I think I will. Um, and I'll probably do it with Yishin. She and I talked about how we're probably going to do swing volume five. We'll do sugar volume two. And then we'll do swing volume six. Swing volume six will be different characters. Oh, awesome. Um, I'm going to. I'm following the uh, Sunstone model he did. I mean, his original plan on Sunstone, excuse me, was to do volumes one through five. Then he was going to do a different book called Mercy, volumes one through five. And then he was going to do a different book called Jasper, volumes one through five. And then he realized I already built this brand Sunstone. So it's going to become Sunstone colon Mercy you know, instead. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, again, you're just doing sales and, and marketing. So we'll, we'll have swing colon. I, I think the sixth volume will be called Unicorn. And I'm not sure what the seventh one, but six through 10 is I'm planning. Um, it's going to be about a, uh, initially it's going to be about a single girl. Uh, volume six will be about a single girl. Uh, volume seven. And it's going to be about a, a well, I don't, I don't want to get too much ahead of myself because I, I haven't really figured it all out yet. But uh, I want to, I want to write, and I've been doing a lot of research and talking to a lot of the women that I know about uh, what dating and what life is like when they're single. And it's been uh, really, really interesting. I think part of the success of these books has been that, I, you know, me and Sedgwick, uh, we've wrapped ourselves so much in the women who are involved in our projects. I mean, Elena Salcedo edits me. She's a woman. You know, I, I work with a, a female artist. Um, originally with Swing, I was co-writing with my wife at the time. Uh, she and I did split up, but it wasn't because of, of swinging or anything crazy like that. Um, and uh, everyone always asks me that, is this based on you and your wife? Because my wife was Asian and, and the dude, Yishin, drew him to look a little bit like me. So it's been, uh, it's been an interesting uh, journey. But uh, I, I, I love doing this stuff. Swing is, is a weird one for me because it's not a book I ever in a million years would have thought I'd write. Yeah. You know, I mean, and that we're veering in that we're veering into it. And, you know, I, I've been doing some research on demographics and stuff like that. And the average reader of my think tank book is a 50 ish white dude. That's the average reader of my think tank book. If you look at my swing book, the average reader is a 40 uh, ish woman. And I, really? I don't have any sort of racial breakdown, but it's, it's 70, 30 women to men. And uh, Sunstone, I think is the same. There are a lot of men that read these books, but uh, they appeal for some reason to women. And, I, and we've sort of done an analysis of it and talked to a lot of the women that read these books. And the primary reason we think is because we delivered these books. And I, I to be fair, I, I followed 100% the pattern that Stepan Sedgwick laid out in Sunstone. You know, I just drafted off of his, uh, his, his innovation and have been successful with this spinoff series. Um, but uh, in Sunstone and in Swing, the, the women are, are in control. They have agency over their actions. They're never doing anything they don't want to do. Um, and, uh, you know, that makes a, a huge difference. Um, I think, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey, I, I found to be uh, somewhat rapey because in many cases, the women involved in those stories weren't doing what they wanted to do. And even in, even in Sunstone, which deals with S&M and control and submission, uh, ultimately, you know, and Sedgwick, he did this the right way. The, sub the submissives are actually really the ones with the power because no matter how much a dominant is going to do something, the submissive has the safe word. And once they say the safe word, it's over, you know, and uh, the interesting thing about sort of uh, getting into and, and, and getting to know these sexual subcommunities is uh, these people are, are interesting. They're, they quite fascinate me because um, 
I have been with my wife and my girlfriend at, at swinger parties and at s and parties, and they actually, at the end of it, feel safer than they would feel being at a club or even at a mall because uh, the males in these groups and in these environments are pretty well trained to be respective and, 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 and you know, cons- consent and all these sort of things. And uh, there's a lot of rules and boundaries and things in place to, to make sure that that happens. I, I'm sure there are groups and environments where this isn't the case. And yeah. I'm not saying universally that these things are done in the right way, but I've found groups of people that engage in these activities. Uh, they're wonderful people. They tend to be very happy people. You know, I think, I think as you get older, you sort of figure out what your kinks are and you want to explore them. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There seems to be a shaming of a lot of these people, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I think I think that that's starting to hopefully die down with the shaming. I, mean, I think people are more accepting to trying new things or not feeling ashamed to try something they enjoy. Um, my wife is uh, she didn't really like um, Sunstone, which was interesting. I thought she would love that. But then I gave her a copy of uh, Swing and she was really into it. And I guess it was because of the marriage angle of it. Um, she really enjoyed yeah. that, um, which actually brings me because she was really excited that I was interviewing you and she wanted to just add one question. Uh, she really wanted to know, I know you said you split up with your wife, but when you were writing it with her, um, I always find interesting. I know you write with a lot of writers. With, um, like, where She wanted to know, did it go smooth or did you guys disagree with what the characters were doing often and things like that? Well, uh, it, it's not a surprise to most people that know me, but uh, a lot of those situations were based on things that she and I got ourselves involved in, in, in sort of the research and experimentation of it. So, um, no, I don't think we disagreed about uh, the writing of it. And for the most part, uh, my, my ex-wife was not a writer. She wasn't a comic book writer, and she didn't actually sit down and type anything into a computer. It was more a, an ongoing discussion in the fact that we had lived through some of these things and uh, had experienced them together, and it was based on real events, uh, not all of it, you know, and obviously these characters grow old together and, and, and live to be in their 80s. Uh, you know, is that possible for me and my ex-wife? Who knows? You know, I mean, I'm actually in the story. I even wrote that they there's a scene where I wrote it's, it's sort of a throwaway scene that they split up for a few years. So who knows? Yeah, I, I think and also that they're re- very realistic. That's the big thing with this story and, and Sunstone, but definitely with Swing is when I'm reading it, the dialogue kind of just seems like something that anybody would have in uh, their current relationship. And I think that's why it hits it too, is we're not into swinging. I'm always, I'm pretty big and experimental, but not swinging. And, but reading it, I'm like, yeah, I can relate to this situation or this fight yeah. or this fixing this relationship in this way. Um, and of course, now that I have a two-year-old with, kid, with the kids scenes, I think are funny or the grandma uh, disconnecting the, uh, <laughs> the video oh. game has happened far too often in my life. Um, well, a lot of these things are based on real events. I mean, yeah. the one nice thing about uh, sort of what we call, what do we call it? Slice of life, the reality sort of writing that we're doing on this stuff is there's no superheroes. There's no supernatural events. There's no disasters. There's nothing. It's just, it's just regular life. They're dealing with regular situations. And uh, I, I would say when I'm writing slice of life stuff and including, I would say think tank and postal, they're also stories that could take place in the real world. I mean, they're extraordinary. I really enjoy taking normal people and putting them through really rigorous and extraordinary circumstances and see how they react. Um, I, I really immerse myself in my research and my writing. And uh, I, I really try to put myself in the head. Like when I wrote the book, The Tithe, um, I grew up, I was raised a right-wing evangelical Christian. I grew into sort of a left of center comic book writer which is an odd journey for most people as they tend to get more conservative as they get older yeah um but uh you know so i I, my point on that is i wrote a book called the tithe and there's two and it's about the tithe is about a uh, hacker her name is samaritan who decides that she's going to steal money from mega churches and give it to charity because she finds what they do repugnant so she wants to be sort of a modern day Robin Hood. It's not anti-christian it's just anti the prosperity doctrine these people that say god wants me to have a jet and, uh, you know, Montel Williams selling uh, God, God uh, <laughs> produced protein powder for yeah. 600 bucks a box that you can buy at Costco for 50. You know, I mean, it's just it, it, it bothers me that uh, these people under the name and guys of Christianity are taking advantage essentially of a lot of old people, because those are the people that donate to these uh, televangelists. You know? Yeah, yeah so. I'm actually reading that series, too, right now. Um, oh because, yeah um, well you've got Dwayne Campbell who yeah. I put myself which is ironically an older guy but I put myself in my 20 year old mindset my 18 yeah. year old mindset when I was in that right wing evangelical Christian mode and that was almost 35 years ago that's how long ago it was it was a long time ago wow. and uh, in my mid-20s when I was writing a book called Lady Pendragon I actually lost my faith in, in Christianity 
uh, because of the research I was doing. And I was very involved at a church in Redondo Beach. I was raised a Baptist, Southern Baptist. And uh, I started asking my pastor all these questions about things I was reading and researching. I'd never heard of the Gnostic Gospels, the Book of Magdalena, you know, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, Sangreal, Sangreal, all these things. I started, I started looking into these things. I started asking all these questions. And then when I discovered the Council of Nicaea with Constantinople and how they designed the Bible itself and started researching all that, I started realizing, I'm like, wow, and I, I'm not trying to offend anyone. This is just my own personal belief. And I, I, I do not try to talk anyone out of their faith ever. Um, and because uh, I just, I'm not one of those asshole atheists that uh, is militant about it. I, I'm more like live and let live for me. I just don't buy it. You know, and in many cases, I'm jealous. You know, I'm jealous of my family that they have such faith. You know, my mom passed away and uh, she was a lifelong Christian, you know, so she believed she was going on to a better place. And, and I hope she is. And I hope she has, you know, I, you know, for me, I, uh, I just think when, when, when it's over, the lights are out and that's all there is. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I'm I, the same way. I, I think, I, I hope, but you know, that's just how I'm realistic. <laughs> yeah. How... You know, but the point is, is I don't, I'm not anti-Christian, okay. you know, I, I don't want to cause anyone to stumble in their own faith. Like I said, I am actually somewhat envious of people with faith. Um, and, uh, you know, like uh, X-Files says, I want to believe with the little uh, UFO. Okay. I have posted in the past a, a, a cross where I said, I want to believe. And it, I don't do it anymore because it always ends up engaging. Like all these Christians want to engage me on it. And the last thing I want to do is talk to them because usually uh, I end up making them question their faith. Yeah. Or you, you know, just because I start, <laughs> well, I just start <laughs> asking some very simple questions, you know, yeah. I'm like, uh, and, and the thing is, it, it's always amazing to me how people have, how few people have actually read the Bible. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I mean, they go to church on Sundays or, or maybe they don't, but you know, I've read the Bible extensively. So you can't, uh, you can't fool me with made up shit <laughs> with the Bible. I know the Bible. So. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm segueing. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Uh, I'm fascinated because I'm reading that story. And uh, when I'm reading it, it's like, yeah, I see these people, The especially I love the beginning where he's just kind of selling this big, uh, it's almost like a concert for him of uh, of right. religion. And, yep. and they're just going in, taking it all. It was just, a, it was very, really, it reminded me of a TV show. So uh, I, I really yeah. enjoyed the opening. I'm only about an issue and a half in, but I even like the detectives that are on the case because again, for me, there, there's great stories out there and they write these great plots. But if you don't have the characters for me to get attached, right. I'm just kind of like, yeah, that's awesome. But uh, who is that person who just died? So I, I already like the characters. Um, but uh, a non-comic question I always like to answer uh, I with uh, these uh, comics, a lot of people grow up with TV shows or movies that kind of get them in the comics or want to write that set. And even you said that uh, you uh, watched like House with uh, some like that character would probably... Uh, relate to someone uh, from Think Tank. Uh, are there any TV shows out there or movies that you watched that you grew up and then you're like, took from it and created a story from it? Or not even took, but uh, inspired by it? Well, Postal was definitely inspired by Northern Exposure and Twin Peaks. I mean, uh, those are the two shows that I think of when I think of Postal. And I, when I tell people that, that's my Hollywood mashup. You know, it's Northern Exposure meets Twin Peaks because it really is about a small town where criminals pay a fee to get to a new identity. And it's full of a bunch of weird people that live, you know, and I don't know if you've ever lived in a small town, but I lived in a town of 800 people once near a military wow. base in Missouri. And when you live in a town that small, uh, you know, everyone, they know it. And I only lived there for two years, but people, you know, you'd walk down the street and people would say, Hey, can you tell your mom? And you know, you know, I mean, people, you don't know these people, you know I mean? Cause <laughs> and you know, like adults and stuff like that. I was a little kid and then people would be you know, and people come by and drop off food and it's just, everyone is, it's just such a different world. But the other thing about small towns is there are a lot of weirdos, man. There are a lot of really small town people that either because they're so isolated for their entire life or, you know, like there's a lot of people in Postal. Almost every character in Postal is based on someone that Brian Hill or I knew at one point in our life, you know, and uh, they, what we always do to get away with anyone being upset about that is we do a mashup of that. We're all uh, I'll take two people I know and mash them into one. <laughs> Smart. and then when they come to me and say uh is that based on me oh no you don't you don't you don't play golf and they're like oh yeah you're right okay it's <laughs> a good way to get away with it um yeah with postal i just had a quick question i'm, I'm i love it i even I, I was a little worried when you brought it back with deliverance because you know you ended postal really well but then deliverance i loved and then right. it kind of ended again i know with covid and everything uh are we getting any more postal maybe i hope so uh okay. rasan ekadal and i are doing a new think tank book um, oh awesome 
So there will be a volume six of that. When that will come out, we don't know yet. Uh, since it's been a while, what we're going to be doing actually with Think Tank is uh, it's going to be about his daughter, uh, Mira Sway. I really like the way I ended Think Tank volume five. It ends, you have this guy who's never really known family in his life, and he's lived this sort of weird, you know, intelligent. He's got the high IQ, but a low EQ. And uh, he has a family, finally. I mean, that was the whole point of that last scene in Think Tank Volume 5 is he's got this family. It's, it's a weird, eclectic family, but he's got a family. And uh, we all need a community and a family like that. Um, and uh, so Volume 6 is actually about his daughter. And uh, it's interesting. I, I, I'm not a fan of the current political climate on either side of the fence. You know, I, I'm not a huge fan of, of cancel culture. Uh, sometimes I think it's deserved, but I'm also not a fan of some of these right-wing nut jobs that are out there saying what they're yeah. saying i'm definitely a little left of center but I'm, I'm more moderate you know i mean it's uh it's interesting how everyone is so knee-jerk reactionary to everything now everyone's offended by everything you know when i was in philosophy class in college one of the few non-science classes i took uh they they taught the harm principle and the offense principle and i remember this was 1988 to 92 whenever it was you know, I mean, the professor even talked about the harm principle is the one that everyone should focus on. You don't want to harm other people. You know, offense is another thing. There are levels of it. But I, I remember when we talked about that, and in my whole life, I've been offended by so many things, but I don't, I don't try to, you know, get people canceled out of their jobs. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm not talking about racism or, you know, overt like sexism or sexual assault or any of these things. All those things are just repugnant and these people should be punished and they should fucking be canceled. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's in the gray area lines of this thing that I, I just find myself shaking my head a little bit. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of in with you. There's, it's just, I get the, that there is a lot that needs to be addressed, but there's some stuff that people get so worked up on. I'm like, maybe we should focus on the actual problems of, but yeah. Well, and sometimes saying? it's it's uh, both sides do this. They, they focus on a narrative. They don't focus on what actually happened. You know, yeah. like I, I've seen this a few times, uh, you know, in, in big cases and things like that, where people just they're making factually incorrect statements. And, and I don't by the way, I don't ever correct anyone. Not my job and not my place in life. And honestly, I don't care enough to do so. <laughs> but uh, I read stuff all the time that people I know, sometimes intelligent people. I'm making bold face bold face claims of things that I know are just completely not true. Yeah. You know, and I'm not talking about stuff where it's subjective, you know, like, or it's a belief issue. I'm talking about, these are factual issues. You know, I was steeped and raised in the scientific community. I have a, I have a physics degree. What do I do with that? Not much, but I'm able to read the science journals and I still read the science journals. And it is horrifying the amount that this country has turned on science. Yeah. You know, I, I understand turning on politicians, you know, fuck them. They're all a lot of jackals. But, yep. uh, you know, scientists are in general, I'd say most scientists I know are, are good people that went into it because they love science and they want to make the world a better place. Yep. Yeah, that, that's a whole other thing that I wish I tell people that I don't try to change people's opinion because all it does is argue. But I try to tell people scientists usually don't care what side they're trying to help you listen to them. But yeah. You know, what no, I'm saying there are scientists like I've seen some very insane politicized comments oh, yeah. that certain scientists have made, you know, and uh, what I'm saying the nice thing about the scientific community is the scientific method itself is designed to filter out in inaccuracies, you know, I mean, the whole peer review and the fact that when someone makes a claim that they were able to do X, Y or Z in the lab, uh, no one believes it until it can be replicated. Yeah, you know, so I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I just, you know, I have two sons and, and I, I really worry about the future. I mean, like I said, I'm a 52 year old guy. So who knows how many years I've got left? I've led a good life. And if I died tomorrow, I wouldn't feel cheated. No, please you know what don't I mean? die tomorrow. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I don't think I'm going to die tomorrow. I'm in pretty good health. But I'm saying if I died yeah. or if I found out I had a six month cancer diagnosis or something like that, like George Perez had, I, I wouldn't. I mean, I'd be sad. I'd be upset, I, you know, of course. But. I wouldn't feel cheated. Like yeah. if I was a 12 year old kid or an 18 year old kid and I had the same diagnosis, I mean, I just, it's so fucked up, you know? Yeah, no. And uh, uh, I don't know. I, I agree. It's yeah. That's news about George Perez was a, a killer because I think, you know, everybody lives their own life, but when you hear it suddenly and, and that's it, uh, it, you know, it hits you hard. Um, I did have actually a question that relates to some of the uh, political stuff going on with, sure. with uh, clock. I actually really enjoyed it. I felt like it was like kind of, not swept under a rug, but it wasn't talked about a lot, which is weird because it was oddly relating to what was happening with people getting sick. Uh, of course, in yep. the clock, they get cancer, which is 
pretty much a death sentence, but it was happening. Um, was that coming out? I, I got the trade, but was that coming out while COVID was happening? The issues? Um, yeah, the it, first two issues came out, uh, I think it was December and January, like yeah, right during right when, when and February was the shutdown, right? Yeah. I mean, because when the shutdown happened, the third issue was supposed to come out the very next week oh. and uh, it got canceled because Diamond shut down for months. And uh, so what happened, I think we didn't publish or ship any books for almost five months, I think it was. And uh, so, so what ultimately happened with, with that was um, we didn't print the third and fourth issues. We just printed the trade. Yeah. Um, so if there's anyone that bought issues one and two and, can, and, and they're angry about it, they don't want to <laughs> pay the full value for the trade, they can uh, hit us up through the Top Cow store or email me directly. And, and I will make sure they get uh, refunded the amount for the two books on the cost of the trade. And they can get a copy of the trade so they can finish the story. Um, because that's the only time in my career that uh, a book didn't come out. The third and fourth issues didn't come out. And it was specifically because of the pandemic. The, the weird thing about that project was I wrote that first issue of that book almost five, six years ago. Um, huh. I'd have to go back and take a look at it. I had just seen the movie Contagion, which I love. And mm -hmm. I'd seen it many times before I watched it. And I'm like, I want to do something like this. And then I came up with the idea for, for uh, The Clock. I wrote it, the first issue uh, full script and I sent it to Colleen Dorn, who agreed to do it. Um, she had four or five other projects and was working on it. We didn't give her like a hard deadline. She said, I'll do it, but I need some time. And so, you know, it took her five years to do four issues, you know? And uh, so then when we finally had it done and we were soliciting it, then the shutdown happens. And the crazy thing was, I mean, there was no pandemic six years ago, you know? Yeah. And so now, you know, when it came out it was right when that was happening. Yeah. Such weird timing, right? I yeah. Mean, it, when I picked it up, I was like, it, you know, because of course, most of these projects are written uh, months or years before. So I knew it wasn't, but it was just like odd timing. And I was like, ah, man, I hope this doesn't completely kill it. And it probably didn't. It was probably more of the shipping issues that killed a lot of series, it looked like in comics, uh, unfortunately, because there were some others I read where. I only got two issues in and then nothing came after that. But um, but yeah, I really enjoyed the clock. Uh, but what I like, uh, what I want to ask is that, you know, with you being with Top Cow so long, uh, I always want to know, like, was there ever someone who came to you with a project or anything and it was a pitch and you're just like, wow, this is going to be something big. And you were so excited uh, to print it and then it actually did become big. Well, um, Sunstone. Yeah. For sure. You know, there's been a lot of projects like that. Rising Stars, Midnight Nation, uh, Wanted with Mark Miller, um, you know, uh, Cyberforce, when we relaunched it in 2011, turned out to be a huge book for us. And uh, I'm sorry, but my delivery is here. Sure. Can I, can I, can yeah, I put yeah, you on pause for a minute? No I mean, wait, you can you, you can come with me, but I'm uh, going to be walking. So it's going to be a little weird. And I got to no, find, no. Put a, my, 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 fuck, that they're delivering to me. I don't need to put a mask on. I have been vaccinated. So, awesome. um, but, uh, well, here I can continue talking. Why not? What was the question? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, so with the uh, projects you were saying, like Sunstone, Cyberforce, uh, those were big ones for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there've been so many, I mean, there've been some like eclipse when it came out from Zach Kaplan. I, I knew that book was going to be good because I just loved the art team and I loved uh, the work he had done on it. Just, uh, you know, the interesting thing on Kickstarter is both Witchblade and Darkness, we did volume one and volume two. The second volumes actually generated more money than the first. I mean, I, uh, I saw that. Yeah. With the, uh, especially with darkness too. I, I missed the chance of getting both one and two hardcover. I'm a big hardcover collector. And I was like, damn. And now I can't even find one. I have two. Uh, I, I can find two and I want to order, but I, I can't find one now, which is my own mistake. But uh, yeah, I saw how successful you guys. I think were. we have a few of those on the top cow store. Oh, do you? Okay. I'll just put yeah. them on there. Cause uh, darkness I've been reading since that's actually one of the cons that got me into comics when I was a kid. Um, but, uh, Witchblade, I actually got more into it when, um, Ron Mars got on and, yeah. uh, I have the whole series from when he started all the way to the newer one that came out a few years ago. I forgot who wrote it. Uh, but, uh, she, she did a pretty good job too, with something new. I haven't seen a Witchblade, but, yeah. uh, but the Ron Caitlin Mars Kittredge was her name. Yeah. Caitlin Kittredge did that, uh, yeah, I mean, and we are in the process of doing a uh, new Witchblade book. I mean, the Witchblade half that we did that was uh, a part of the Witchblade uh, Kickstarter, that was actually written by Marguerite Bennett. Um, oh, awesome. And uh, she's writing the series. So we're doing a new Witchblade series that she is writing. Um, we have not announced the artist yet, and it's not the artist that did the half. So I, I don't think I can yet announce who the artist is, but they are working on that book i believe we're tentatively looking at a quarter three launch next year um that's not confirmed but um that's a, approximately it might be 
it would be later, not before. So it's either quarter three, quarter four. Or if we push it into 23, I'll be surprised. But uh, the goal was to launch a Witchblade book in 22, a Darkness book in 23, and then we're going to do Cyberforce and Aphrodite. Um, those are the four sort of uh, hardcore Top Cow series that uh, we wanted to rejuvenate. And uh, Mark is writing Cyberforce. I'll be writing Aphrodite 9. Um, Witchblade is Marguerite Bennett, and uh, Darkness is Mark as well. Oh, wow. Well, Darkness is another one where I really liked the one that came out a few years ago. It kind of reminded me of the, the video games, which I enjoyed a lot, too. Um, so with Darkness, um, I did want to ask, uh, they used to cross over a lot with which player. Are we ever going to get like a maybe another crossover down the line or is that was that more like the 90s? OK, good. Uh, of course. No, which and Darkness um, always were intended to to inhabit the same space. I mean, awesome. it just works so well. You have a, a female police detective and a male criminal. Who yes. are attracted to each other, you know, and that uh, that causes all kinds of interesting story ideas and things that that can take place over a long period of time. And just FYI, what we're doing now with Witchblade in the Darkness, I'm not sure if we're doing this with Cyberforce and Aphrodite. I don't think we are, but we might. I mean, is we are doing actually a hard reboot, which we've never done. I mean, uh, Witchblade it had the same continuity from 1995 to two or three years ago when we ended it. And I actually wrote the uh, last pages of Witchblade. A lot of people oh. don't know that, but uh, Ron Mars and I wrote Witchblade 185. He wrote the first half, I wrote the second half. So I oh, actually have the privilege of having written the uh, final words that Sarah Pizzini, the original Sarah Pizzini said, which was quite an honor. And the, and the crazy thing about that is that's the first time I ever wrote the character. <laughs> the last and the first, that's pretty awesome. I didn't know yeah. that. Um, so with that, uh, what was the uh, question I had about? Oh, so I know you said this a few months ago or maybe a year ago now on Facebook uh, with swing selling, you asked people, would you rather have like two big hard covers of it or just one big one? Uh, are you thinking of releasing either one? Because again, I'm a huge, just hardcover collector. So I'd love to have swing in like a, either two or a I, big I, one. I think probably I'll go for the, I, I like the bigger ones, you yeah. know, for me, it's like having a $50 hardcover or a $30 omnibus of, of the entire arc. And if you have four or five volumes, it easily fits into one hardcover omnibus. Yeah. You know, I mean, the reason why Cedric's books uh, ended up being into two hardcovers for the first five volumes is he, he did like, I think Sunstone volume five was 256 pages. Yeah. You know, huge. I mean, yeah, I mean, most of, all swings are 128 pages and they have about 90 pages of story and art in there. Um, so, you know, that's just his entire and the 285 he did, I think it was 270 pages of story and art. So for Sunstone volume five was essentially the same size as swing one to three. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, well, I just um, gave my friend the uh, volume one to five to read because I have the hard covers for Sunstone. And he was like, wow, why is this one so much bigger? I was like, don't worry, you'll still read at the same speed. It's, it's captivating. Yeah. And with that, uh, I actually asked him too uh, the other day or not the other day, uh, about two months ago, uh, are we going to get a third hardcover of Sunstone now that Mercy's yeah. out? Uh, okay, good, because I, I like Mercy yep. a lot, too, so I was hoping we get more of that. I'm not sure which one we'll do it for. Um, Cedric is not as big a fan of crowdfunding and, mm. and stuff like that. He doesn't like trendy stuff, as he calls it. Like he, He's not a fan of NFTs at all. I'm not really either. Yeah. Um, I know people are making money on them. I just... There's a lot, I've seen a lot of people make money on a lot of things in my career. I can say pogs, you know, all, all kinds of insane shit that uh, to me was always kind of a scam. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know enough about N NFTs to call it a scam, but uh, it sure certainly feels that way. <laughs> yeah, no, they, I know a little bit about it. And my friend's big into it and he kind of I usually right. trust his opinion on stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it doesn't sound too great, but I'm glad that he is he is making more. Um, so I'm really my last question comes to uh, I know you just announced about like seven projects, but are there any other projects, maybe ones coming even sooner that you want to promote and talk about so people can. Uh, I know the Kickstarter just finished right for the darkness too. I still got five more days. So oh, sweet. Uh, no, Cyberforce is up for the 30th anniversary Cyberforce hardcover collection, sweet. which um, the art for that will actually, I think, look better than the original because we actually had to recreate all the pages. I mean, almost oh. all that art was lost. All the digital files were lost. So we spent painstakingly over the last several years recreating a lot of that stuff slowly. And uh, it actually, in my opinion, looks better than some of the original stuff. Because, awesome. uh, you know, computers are better these days, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I'm doing a book called Colossus. It's, it's uh, the Clay People colon Colossus, so I won't get sued by Marvel. But uh, <laughs> the Clay People is a heavy metal band. Uh, the lead singer used to be in a band called Owl. I'm not a heavy metal guy, but uh, that seems to be a, a fairly well-known metal band, Owl. Um, 
and they did a song called Colossus. And I, I listened to this song and uh, he asked, and through this video game guy I work with, he asked if I'd be interested in doing a comic adaptation of the words of the song. And I'm like, how would one do that? You know, um, I'd actually talked to Neil Peart years ago about doing some Rush songs because I'm a huge Rush fan. And, and I loved some of the lyrics of, of some of their songs. And I know Philip Sablick at Boom tried to do the same thing. I don't know why it never happened for either one of us, but uh, maybe they're hard to make deals with or they didn't want it. Who, who knows? I mean, I, I'm not disparaging Rush. I, I think they're amazing. But uh, the point is, is uh, I, I listen to the song and metal is not for me. It's not, I, I'm more yeah. of an alter- alternative guy. You know, I don't really like hip hop either, but uh, I really like alternative. Um, but uh, so I listened to the song and it, it was very clearly about depression and drug use and all these sort of things. And I kept listening to it and I got kind of a sense of, uh, abuse like there was some abuse issues so I, I remember speaking to one of the band members and I said is there you know is this really about tormenting is there some about bullying is there hey how you doing sorry uh is there any uh, you know I asked the guy if there was anything to this and he he said yes and I'm like interesting so I, I wrote this story about a Jewish kid in uh, the Midwest who lived in a very small town his mother was an Air Force uh, uh you know our uh, she worked for the Air Force and does this sound familiar? You know, there's so much of my life in so many of these books. <laughs> and I think that's why they're relatable. You know, I mean, I, I really, all the successful books I've done have been somewhat based on my reality or characters or people I've known, you know, like David Lauren. That's how I talk. Yeah. You know, I don't talk as misogynistically as I once did, but that is how I talked when I was younger. Yeah. And I realized that now, like, you know, there's certain things you just can't, you can't say in ways you can't talk like that we did when we were kids. Nah. And I think for that, you know, I, I, I'm not besmirching woke culture and stuff like that, but uh, for, for that part, I, I think the world's a better place because uh, I, there are so many little subtle things. And you know, my sons are half Asian and they don't look white. And uh, I've seen them get upset from being bullying or having people be racist against them. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting as a white man, I, I think it's difficult to truly understand the deep insidious nature of racism because it's rare that it happens to us but for me i was able to see it and i was able to see the pain through the eyes of my son you know and uh that really affected me man i mean it it affected me in a way and i think having children and that experience and having non-white children that were treated unwell in certain circumstances and and i had to sort of interact and deal with it um, it sort of changed me into the more, I guess, liberal and left thinking social person I am today. Well, I mean, that's what I read stories for is to get different perspectives on things, things that I can never be or relate to. You know, I grew up with a, a black stepfather, so I've been in situations where I walk into a store with him and, you know, he feels like somebody is watching him at all times. I'm just like, I can't relate to that, but I can see him and how he feels. And it upsets me to see that, you know, things right. that like that. It's you can only feel what they feel by watching and, you know, being close to them. that. Other people just say it's not real, but but it is. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I love stories like that. So I, I can't wait to read that. Is that um, so is that a Kickstarter or is that just coming out? No, it'll be a, a regular comic book. It's 48 pages. I think there's 40 pages of story um, and uh, it, it's four ninety nine. It comes out in early March. Okay. Also, people. I've already written it. It's done. In fact, the the story is about a Jewish golem. I mean, it's it's a half Jewish, half Asian kid growing up in the Midwest outside of a base. And and imagine being in a small town where you're you and one black kid and one Mexican kid are the only non-white kids in the school. You know, and uh, so I've I've seen situations like that. My my nephew, who's in his late thirties now, he might be forty. He's half Filipino, and he grew up in Colorado in an all-white school. And he had a, a horrible time. And uh, I used to think it was just because he was a tool, you know, but uh, as I've gotten to know him better, uh, I realized that he was just radically mistreated, yeah. you know, and it's, it's hard, you know, and the thing is, I think people in those scenarios, uh, they get defensive because they're used to being treated. And then when they react to things that may not be what they think they are, they're just so used to reacting in that way. Yeah. So I, uh, I feel, I mean, I, I, my emotional sort of uh, empathy and sympathy, I think, has, has definitely grown in my 40s and 50s. Yeah. Well, uh, that's also. Awesome. I can't wait to read that story. And then you got so many things coming out. I didn't even know about the darkness, which, but all that, that's, that's exciting to me as someone who 
not only grew up with them, but is still currently reading them. I actually um, uh, going to be interviewing Ron Mars too, and I'm going to get deep into Witchblade because that to me is a really interesting series because, you know, sometimes the older series don't stand the test right. of time. I think that does. Um, so uh, thank you so much though for coming on well, here. Uh, when oh, you talk to Ron, yes. tell him one thing. Okay. Tell him, in my opinion, he is still the definitive Witchblade writer. <laughs> I, uh, you know, and, I and, agree. And I, I tell you the reason why is because he did the longest run on it and he sort of established the character as being okay for uh, people to read. Yeah, I think it's very, uh, when I read it, it, it doesn't feel, you know, sometimes people bring up the whole, well, this feels like it's written by a man for a woman character. I don't feel that way when reading The Witchblade. I feel like they're just characters. I don't, right. I don't feel like it doesn't feel like someone's writing someone else, but I will let him know that when I interview him. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on. Uh, guys, there's so many things to check out. Uh, obviously, been in the business since 1993, you said? Uh, April 93 is when I started. <laughs> There you go. So you go all the way back then, pick up some of his works. I've read about, I'd say half of your stuff now. Um, and, but swing people, trust me, please read it. It's not what you think it is. When you hear someone talk about it. go read it. It's so good. Um, and it went, ended up on my second favorite adult comic currently being published. So check it out. And uh, thank you again so much for coming on the show. And if people want to read some of my stuff for free, just to check it out, you can go to topcow.com. Look at the menu. There's a section that says free comics. I believe there are eight of my volume one graph novels there. Think Tank, Postal, uh, Swing. You can read the first volumes. Not not like the first issue, but the entire first volume. Wow. Uh, for, for free. They're all there as digital downloads. Uh, I always call that the comic book drug deal. First one's free. <laughs> no, really. And uh, even <laughs> most of the image stuff is like 10 bucks for the first volume. So yeah, we try to make it reader reader friendly. I mean, that's the market now. People need to try something before they want to invest themselves into it. But, or uh, Hoopla. And there's millions of yeah. things. Do, do some to read these books. They're, they're great. All my books are on Hoopla. So oh, if you want to read them for free, go to go to get them from the library. There we go. All right, guys, you and uh, come back. Uh, leave some comments below. Let us know what you think. If you've been reading his work, let us know as well. And you guys enjoy the interview. And I will be back.